So um, on to our first um, session of the day, our first speaker. Um, we're going to be looking at new directions in transport policy with fantastic Stephen jo Joseph. So um, Stephen is going to be sort of talking through how the new government um, potentially will be affecting transport policy. And Stephen's going to take a close look at the key themes from the new government's transport plans and analyse how it differs from the Conservatives' previous policies. Finally, he's going to uncover what can be expected during the course of the next five years to encourage more people to use cars less and offer greater choice to everyone. So a little bit about um, Stephen. So Stephen is a transport policy consultant specialising in urban and local issues and in smart transport. He was the chief exec of Campaign for Better Transport from 1988 to 2018, and he is now a professor at the University of Hertfordshire's Smart Mobility Unit, having received an honorary doctorate from the university in November 2010. He was awarded an OBE in 1996 for services to transport and the environment. So fantastic to have you here, um, Stephen. And just to let you know um, that there will be a QA and a um, after our next speaker, Tom Knight. So um, as Stephen is talking, get on Slido and ask those questions and we'll, there'll be some time in about 20 minutes to go through them. So over to you, Stephen. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Um, and uh, yes, I've been asked to talk about um, you know, new directions in transport policy, what the new government might mean, and I've tried to do that and look at what that might mean for commuting. Next slide, please. So this is me. Um, I think you've already heard all that. Um, I'm also trustee and chair of the Foundation for Integrated Transport, which has been funding a number of campaigns and um, uh, research projects on transport. Next slide, please. So just to start with where this government's coming from, firstly, I, sh I should uh, preface this by saying I'm not here as an apologist for this government. I'm not. I'm just here to, uh, as it were, read the runes and say what they're doing. Um, and uh, so um, uh, all the errors are theirs rather than mine. Um, this is a mission-led government, and you've heard all this. These are the five missions. Um, and the key point here is that transport policy has to support um, these missions. And um, so uh, th this is, and actually where the Department for Transport is coming from is, has been already starting to talk about this. Next slide, please. So um, Louise Haig, the Transport Secretary, has talked about, uh, has uh, said as her motto, move fast and fix things. And she set five priorities for the department, improving performance on the railways and driving forward rail reform, improving bus services and growing usage across the country, transforming infrastructure to work for the whole country, promoting social mobility and tackling regional inequality, delivering greener transport and better integrating transport networks. And that last one, in a sense, um, is a sort of overarching one um, that, over, uh, that covers um, the other four. Next slide, please. Now, already some directions of travel um, for the new government are clear. Uh, we've had a commitment to bus reform, um, giving powers to franchise buses on the London model um, available to all local authorities, and also allowing um, uh, the, uh, the setting up of publicly owned bus companies. Um, it, just to make it clear for people who don't know uh, the, the finer detail of bus um, uh, systems, um, the way things work at the moment is that outside London, um, until recently, buses were re deregulated, um, uh, whereas in London, uh, Transport for London um, uh, lets contracts, sets fares, and um, and uh, sets the timetable. Um, and um, it's already been the case that those powers have been available to mayors outside cities. Um, so, um, uh, um, and uh, Andy Burnham, pictured there with his Beeline bus, has already taken advantage of those um, to introduce um, uh, more, um, uh, to, to um, take control of the buses, to uh, move from one in which the bus companies decided what services to run to one where Transport for Greater Manchester lets contracts for those. Um, so, um, uh, and about publicly owned bus companies, there are already a few in uh, in the uh, UK, um, in that um, Reading Buses, Nottingham City Transport, um, Lothian Regional Transport, for example, are all 
um, publicly owned bus companies. I should say, by the way, the University of Hertfordshire has its own bus company, UNO, um, so I suppose you could add that to the list. Um, the, uh, the, but anyway, that's what is happening with bus reform. Rail reform, we've already seen a, a bill go through Parliament to start the process of renationalising the passenger rail operators. Um, Great British Railways and a, a guiding mine for the railways has been um, uh, set up in shadow form. Um, the government has had a commitment to a duty to promote freight traffic on the railways, increased use of the railways for freight, and a commitment to a new passenger voice. So these are, are clear um, uh, directions of travel. Next slide, please. Um, there are also some emerging themes from the government on what to do about what they want to do about transport. Um, uh, Louise Haig has talked about an end to the culture wars on active travel um, and um, has been very open about um, the, the fact that there will be unprecedented investment in cycling and walking, <clears throat> particularly notably that this will contribute to the fixing of the NHS to um, moving to preventative um, health care rather than just um, uh, caring for people once they get ill. Um, so um, we, we wait to see what that means, but they um, there's a move, um, the last government moved from being rather supportive of 20 miles an hour and um, zones and um, low traffic neighbourhoods. And then um, under Rishi Sunak, it um, had a plan for motorists and opposed those. Um, and uh, there's a uh, this is about moving back to that. Um, uh, however, I, I'll come. There's a however, which is about devolution. I'll come to that in a moment. Uh, secondly, there's a review of transport infrastructure projects, the projects that have been uh, uh, inherited by this government. We've already seen the cancellation of the um, Stonehenge Tunnel um, and of the Arundel Bypass, or rather, the delay of that. Um, but um, there's a, a, a full review going on. A panel of advisors um, uh, is reviewing the, the schemes that have been inherited um, and making recommendations on what should happen to those. Um, uh, thirdly, um, there is a move to create a national integrated transport strategy, which I know has been talked about a lot. Um, uh, but uh, anyway, there, there is now a team being put in place. Um, Danny Williams, who has been running out to Travel England, um, is heading that up. Um, and there'll be a team inside the Department for Transport to create such a strategy. The idea is that this will not be a huge strategy. It will move fast um, with a view to getting something in by um, next summer, um, uh, but with implementation plans to follow. And there's also a commitment to a road safety strategy, which we haven't had for a while. Um, having had reductions in road casualties, um, there's a move to um, uh, 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 the, the progress in reducing road casualties has flatlined. Um, and there's, um, uh, this government has said it wants to uh, change that and have a new road safety strategy to reduce casualties. As I've said, there are wider um, uh, policies that the government has that will affect transport, particularly devolution. The government's committed to de devolution of budgets and powers, especially to mayors, combined authorities in more places. So we can see um, that there will be um, changes in um, uh, in what happens anyway. Um, Louise Haker said that although she'll support councils in uh, putting in things like 20 miles an hour zones, um, that uh, it isn't for her to do that. And I think there'll be a move to um, making it um, uh, less necessary to seek Secretary of State approval to put in particular types of pedestrian crossing, which is the case at the moment. Um, secondly, in terms of wider policy, there's a renewed commitment to tackling climate change and to net zero. Um, Julia has already mentioned um, the renewed commitment to a ban on petrol, new petrol and diesel vehicles from 2030. Um, but that's part of, as people have seen, of a much wider commitment on um, tackling climate change. And the third commitment is about house building, commitment to 
million new houses to new towns and there's question marks about how that will relate to transport um i think that's uh, i'll come back to that but i think that's uh, an important issue here next slide please now there are also still some big unknowns in what they're doing um on spending um we've heard all about the 22 billion pound black hole no, also a commitment to no return to austerity but also keeping inherited departmental budgets um it's unclear how that will those circles will be squared um uh, i think um uh, this will mean all sorts of um questions about various inherited infrastructure projects um but um uh, that's uh, um you know still to come and there's also uncertainty around taxation will there be increases in field duty um will there be moves to road user to paper mile forms of road user charging um the um uh, there's certainly a view from uh, some economists um, and transport groups that as there's an increase in electric vehicles, um, re uh, revenue from fuel duty will drop off and therefore the government will need to resort to some replacement to that. Um, my old organisation, Campaign for Better Transport, recently produced a report uh, supported by 37 other organisations, including motoring organisations, suggesting a move towards road user charging um starting with electric vehicles who don't pay any mileage charge i think the nightmare here for some for government is what's happened in norway where which has moved very far and fast on electric vehicles now has a a, a black hole in its finances from because um it's lost all the revenue that it used to get from um fuel duty so there's big questions around spending and taxation um and what that means in practice um, well, question about future of roads. In fact, one of the junior ministers in the department, Lillian Greenwood, is actually uh, has a title of Minister for Future of Roads. Um, so um, we've seen some projects dropped, as I've mentioned, but there are uncertainty on some big ones, uh, like the Lower Thames Crossing, um, which is a very big scheme, um, A66, um, and there are battles going on um, between uh, different lobby groups uh, on that. Um, clearly, um, uh, there's some uh, big questions there. Um, a lower terms crossing alone is of the order of nine to ten billion pounds. Um, so, um, there's been talk of that being turned into a private finance scheme, but um, that has all sorts of knock on impacts. Um, there's also a question of HS2. Um, uh, you know, is that going to be um, having been cut back? Uh, is that going to be reborn? Um, but also underneath those, some much smaller schemes, um, some electrification schemes on the railways, um, uh, what happens to road maintenance um, where, and uh, dealing with potholes and all of that. So there's questions there. Um, I think underneath all that, um, this is where it gets into the weeds of transport policy. Um, but uh, there's um, certainly moves to revive, revise the way in which the Department of Transport does business cases, um, appraises transport projects, models transport, so that it's more user-centred, less focused on small time savings. I'll come back to that in a moment. And I think there's question marks, as I've said, about the links between transport and planning. Um, uh, yeah, up till now, um, there's been relatively limited links between um, uh, uh, local plans, house building, etc., and what happens on transport. I've been part of a group called Transport for New Homes, which has been looking at this. Um, and um, uh, I think there's questions about what that will mean, those 1.5 million homes, and also associated business parks and other um, developments will in practice mean in relation to transport. And obviously that's big for mobility ways and people listening. So, um, uh, benchmarks for, for looking for where they're going on this the budget at the 30th of October which I think will look at some of this um, there's plans for a three-year spending review um, completed in March 2025 which will set three-year spending plans that's where these unknowns will be fleshed out next slide please so what does all this mean for commuting well um, I've got a few uh, thoughts here 
Um, I think public transport options might improve. So, for example, with bus franchising, it will be easier to work with councils to get better bus services for journeys to work. It won't just rely on what count, uh, what operators can make happen. Um, so I think we will see um, some, um, uh, there will be opportunities to do more with um, local authorities um, and employers to improve um, uh, public transport options. Um, uh, the, there'll be the renewed push on electric vehicles that we've mentioned already, but, and that will, I think, need to look at costs, charging infrastructure, availability, all of those things. Um, and I think we'll, we will see more investment in active travel routes. Um, uh, uh, Louise Haig, as Transport Secretary, has been very clear about that. Um, and that will include uh, for journeys to work. So there are opportunities there in relation to commuting. Next slide, please. But I, I think there are also some opportunities for change. This is my list of things that might make a difference um, and which might be things that Mobility Ways and others might want to push for. So I think there's opportunities to change the tax system so it rewards zero carbon commuting uh, for car sharing, more tax recycle allowances, tax free season tickets or travel cards, um, as happens in the US, for example, and in Ireland, those are opportunities that could be taken. Um, um, and I think um, the last government, in when it had a transport decarbonisation strategy, talked about um, a commute zero partnership to bring together employers, councils, government, employees, um, to bring together those that wanted to reduce um, uh, to, to move towards zero carbon commuting, um, and that sort of got lost. Um, I think it would be an opportunity to resuscitate that um, and make something work um, on that. Um, affordable fares. Um, the Germans and Austrian governments have uh, produced what, they, what the Austrians call a climate ticket, a cheap public transport ticket, and actually um, Greenpeace have just done, had a piece of work which the Foundation for Integrated Transport Part funded, um, looking at how you might make something like that work here and you can imagine how that might work in the context of um, uh, uh, employers and commuting and i think there's a, a, a topic um i ali and Cl ali clavin and i've discussed this many times about changing the way in which transport modeling is done so it counts people rather than vehicles so that in looking at say a motorway you don't judge its success on how many vehicles are going past but how many people are going past and giving those running the motorways or, or, or roads incentives to reduce um, car um, to introduce car sharing to support coaches and so on. Those are just a, a set of um, uh, ideas for um, uh, that you might want to see uh, that would follow from what the government said so far. Um, next slide, please. Um, so here's a list of things that might move away from car dependence, less car-based development, better public transport, making cycling a real option, and so on. Uh, transport can be better and greener, um, uh, but the, these are things that might work. Um, next slide, please. And so conclu uh, in conclusion, there is a new government. It has announced some new directions in transport policy within its missions. Uh, wider policies, for example, on decarbonisation, devolution and planning will have impacts on transport. Some big decisions lie ahead, especially on spending and taxation, and especially on roads policy and the management of the roads. And within all of this, there will be opportunities to promote, promote zero carbon commuting and mobility ways and others can pursue these. Next slide. Thank you very much. There's some contacts. Thank you very much, Stephen.